Hey folks, this is William Strook, and uh, today I am talking about John J. Pershing. Uh, this is the third video in the series I'm doing about my history book, Pershing in Command, represented by Ann Tannenbaum. Um, and today what I'd like to discuss is John J. Pershing's tactics and his tactical doctrine and what that meant during the Great War. Now, a bit of background. Uh, of course, when America entered the war, uh, the Germans and the Allies had been fighting for uh, four years, and they had developed a set of tactics uh, through bloody trial and error uh, to fight what we now know as trench warfare. And this usually consisted of massive artillery preparations in the case of the British and French disaster on the Somme in 1916, this lasted a week. Uh, those to be followed by human wave attacks, uh, which resulted in just hundreds of thousands of casualties. The British took 60,000 casualties on the first day on the Somme. Uh, now, going into 1918, both sides understood that they were pretty much exhausted and were adapting their tactics accordingly. The Germans, of course, had come up with their stormtrooper tactics, which involved small groups infiltrating ahead, uh, wire cutters, flamethrowers, which the Allies were terrified by at first. Um, and using these tactics, in, in uh, March of 1918, they broke both the British and the French lines and were driving on Paris. At the same time, uh, the British, coming off of a disaster at the Somme in 1916, and then the Passchendaele uh, of 1917, uh, they had a, evolved their own tactics, which centered around using tanks to break through the wire and move through the artillery. And they had come up with a, a, a nascent, I would say, combined arms doctrine, which they unleashed at Amiens on August 8th, 1918, which the Kaiser and Ludendorff called the Black Day of the German Army. That's when they knew they couldn't win the war. And it saw artillery, infantry, armor, and air power all used in conjunction. It's the forerunner to the to the, uh, the last uh, battle of the 20th century in Desert Storm. Um, it was an early blitzkrieg, really. So both sides had adopted tactics uh, to deal with the problem before them. Now, it's often thought that the problem with the First World War was machine guns and heavy artillery, and yes, that had changed the way war was fought, but... As, as we see studying the war, maneuver was still popular in the Eastern Front. It was still possible in the Middle East. What was really happening was the problems of space and mass, and that you had these massive national armies in a very compact space, in this case, the Western Front, uh, France and Belgium, and there just wasn't any man no room to maneuver. Now, looking at this in 1917, John J. Pershing decided that he had the answer. He called it open warfare. Now, he was basing this on a couple of assumptions and a couple of American experiences, and we talked about uh, one of those the other day, being the American Civil War, which saw trench warfare. And we mentioned how uh, John Pershing thought it was very detrimental to troops. Robert Lee Bullard, growing up in the South, knew a lot of old Confederate war veterans who, who hated being in the trenches around Vicksburg thought it just sapped their morale, and so both men wanted to avoid trench warfare at all costs. What Pershing came up with, based on this, uh, he called it open warfare, and what he was saying was, we are going to punch through the enemy lines, and we're going to maneuver behind them and fight this open warfare concept, and one of the things that separated his concept from what the Allies and Germans were doing was being an American, Pershing placed a huge emphasis on marksmanship, and that, too, is only natural. Uh, again, the other day we talked about Pancho Villa's uh, failed raid on Columbus, New Mexico. His column uh, got shot to bits by the American soldiers there. Americans uh, have a gun culture, we always have, and Americans can shoot naturally better shooters than any of our enemies. The, the, the Germans, the Japanese, the Marines thought were lousy shots compared to Americans could do. So the American rifleman going into the First World War was an excellent shot. Pershing thought this was very important to the rifleman's sense of himself, sense of being a soldier. Uh, and the British and the French thought it, it didn't matter anymore. They were more concerned with um, uh, 
formation and hand grenades and flamethrowers and mortars. Pershing wanted men who could shoot and hit a target, and this would pay some dividends. Uh, in the first battles that the United States got involved in, uh, places like Cantigne, when the Germans counterattacked, they ran into this wall of lead put up by these sharpshooting Americans. Same was true of Bellewood, where the Marines just chopped attacking German units down. Uh, same thing with the, some of the early battles on the Marne, you know, the Rock of the Marne battle. Again, American marksmanship was deadly. Only problem was, wasn't necessarily as deadly or useful in attack. Um, and the second aspect of this open warfare is Persians said, we're going to maneuver, but first we need mass. We have to punch our way through German lines. And to do that, they had to have enough men on hand. And that's why American divisions in the First World War were these massive organizations. Uh, 28,000 men. That's about three times the size of a, a British or German division in the First World War. It's twice the size of an American division today. About twice the size. It depends on the unit uh, involved. Uh, each brigade was the, was the size of a uh, British division. Each regiment was the size of a British uh, brigade. The American division was the size, uh, size of a British Army Corps. You get the idea. So these were massive formations, which had to be moved, which was a problem, and also had to be fed and armed and clothed, and their trucks had to have fuel. And, and just getting these units through the battlefield proved to be a tremendous problem for the AEF. So going into uh, the First World War, the, Amer the American Expeditionary Force had this uh, battle doctrine, maneuver warfare, open warfare. But the mistake Pershing made, and this cost a lot of American lives, was that he did not, his open warfare did not account for the German concept of defense. And anyone who studied the World Wars knows what, knows what this is. Germans, you know, they did not have static lines. We have this mental image of trenches filled with men firing at oncoming Tommies and Doughboys and Poilus, but that really wasn't the case. The Germans uh, had a very thin forward trench line with maybe some skirmishers and a lot of machine gun nests scattered here and there. The whole point, the German concept of defense, was to absorb the initial blow, gradually fall back, and gather your strength. Uh, and then, being Germans, what would they do? Well, they just couldn't help themselves from doing it because they were Germans any more than the British can help being great peacetime soldiers and any one of the Americans can help being great engineers and builders in times of war. And the aftermath, the Germans would counterattack. And time and again, they would counterattack on American units that were not prepared to receive that counterattack because they were organizing to continue to advance. Uh, per Pershing's open warfare policy. Now, we'll go into the de more detail about this in later videos, but early on, American commanders learned that these open warfare mass movement tactics were pretty much suicidal uh, and would just leave a carpet of bodies behind them. Uh, almost universally, by the end of a, a battle they were in, whether it was Bellew Wood or the Marne or Meuse Argonne, American local commanders were abandoning these, ta these open warfare tactics and advancing what they would call quick rushes. Groups of men, small groups of men, finding some terrain that was advantageous, running forward, hitting the deck, letting their comrades cover them while they did so, and laying down covering fire so their comrades could do the same. That's how the AEF fought by uh, 11 November 1918. And that uh, certainly goes against Pershing and his open warfare tactics. Well, that's all we have for this for today on purging and open warfare tactics. I um, hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm William Struck, and thanks for watching.